the final countdown we are launching our epic online technology meeting on photonics for new space. Remember when the European Space Agency recently advertised for new astronauts? I was thinking about applying myself and maybe I'm already too old. But less well known is that ISA's incubator program for young startups is a brilliant success story. ISA is a giant system integrator that's always hungry for new collaborations with innovative companies, large and small. And that means a great opportunity for the nearly 700 EPIC members to go from concept to mission payload in record time. We are delighted to be working closely with ISA over the last four years. Since then, we have scored dozens of success stories. In this sector, you have the so-called space primes. These are companies at the top of the space supply chain. Names like Thales, Leonardo and Safran immediately spring to mind. But that core prime club is growing. Newcomers such as Minaric, formerly Dialight, are focused on integrating their laser products for high data rate and long distance data transmission. So how will they answer our epic question? It's a company that is constantly challenging the entire supply chain to provide ultra high spec components needed for satellite broadband communication. They can already transmit direct to earth data at 10 gigabit per second. But how do they see the next three years and how can we speed things up even further? And that's not all. On Wednesday, March 31st, we will have a company in the room with 300 years of space experience. Spire! And you know why they are coming? They've launched more than 100 satellites. So if you want your photonic devices in orbit, they can make it happen. So let's talk. Today, we are also delighted to announce our cooperation with the Access Space Association. They have built an alliance of expertise to solve the upcoming challenges for the future nanosatellite constellations. And the way things are going, next year we'll talk about PICO or even ATO satellites. You know, somebody told me the other day that CTO at EPIC means Chief Technology Observer? And it's true. In my travels, real and virtual, I get to see photonics solving important problems like the metal optics of Sonex reflecting light in the harshest environment possible, or the beam shaping solutions of Kylabs manipulating light shape at the highest power, or the 50 femtosecond pulses from the lasers from Valo Innovations. I wish I could mention it all, but hey, this isn't my last video. So join our virtual space mission. Countdown stops at exactly 3 p.m. on Wednesday, March 31st. Sign up now to contribute in the Zoom room or follow us live in the Epic YouTube channel. Live long and prosper. Safe journeys. My little tribute to the European Space Agency and also my little tribute to Star Trek and especially Spock. Thank you very much, all of you, all of you for being at a space meeting virtually. Soon we're going to be traveling again and we're going to organize our biannual meeting inside the European Space Agency. But this is as good as it gets and in some sense, even better. And you will see why. First thing I want to say is like, thank you. Thank you so much for all the amazing support. Tomorrow, tomorrow is one year since we organized our first online technology meeting. And we organized already 80 online technology meetings plus other events in total, more than 120 events on this year. Thank you so much for all the support. We couldn't have done this without you. Well, a meeting without people would be boring. I also speak also on behalf of a fantastic team of EPIC experts, 15 people who we dedicate our life to the photonic industry. And you already know everything we do, so I'm not going to bother you with that. What I can say is that today is our last meeting of the season three of the online technology meetings. The season three we finished today. What a fantastic season it has been. We talk about fashion. We have a meeting on green energy. We had a meeting on 3D printing. We even talk about robotics. It was truly great. We love this season. And after a short Easter break, on the 12th of April, we start season 
for these are the online meetings for the season four of our online technology meetings sign up early to participate online we selected this topic just to make sure that every epic member has at least two events that are relevant for them it took quite a long time to decide on this topic we did our very best thank you for all the feedback that we received also remind everyone that for the first time in 2021 epic also supports the quantum industry and on the 9th of april we have a meeting on quantum space and sorry quantum communications and qkd actually today one of the companies says it's going to talk to us about a brief intro for qkd in space but today today we talk about new space first of all thank you very much our media partners electro optics we couldn't have done this without you thank you for the strong promotion to you do for all our events and also thank you for our new friend and partner in crime access space i will explain what they are doing with us later. But this meeting would be possible without the support of our sponsors today. Thank you very much. First of all, all the way from Finland, Modulite, they make semiconductor lasers from the material growth all the way to making turnkey full systems in clinics and in space solutions. NIT, if you're looking for s weird sensors, shortwave infrared, you go to NIT. They actually call it five for space different sensors. They cover the wavelength range between 900 nanometers to 1.7 micrometer with fully full CMOS sensor technology. If you are looking for retro reflector technology, you go to PLX. They have the new active optical division that extends their capability to solving customers' very precise problems in the space industry. If you're looking for metal optics, you go to Aken. You go to Aken and you talk to Song X. Song X delivers optical mirrors and subassemblies for space applications. If you're looking for coatings and filters, you go to Chroma, and Chroma develops some of the best optical filters in the market with technology based on thin film deposition on optics. If you are looking for a partner, you're looking for a partner for the assembly, packaging and testing, any of the electronic, Ficontech. Ficontech provides flexible multi-head micro welding system for high precision aerospace optical assembly test. Thank you very much, all our sponsors today. We have a fantastic agenda, a very, very busy agenda. We're going to keep it in time for sure. And we're going to cover all the different topics with some of the most important companies in this sector. Actually, my team and I, we took the time to study every company that registered to the meeting today. These are the companies that registered for the meeting today. We position them in the supply chain. Why? Because we want to make sure that today, today you find suppliers, customers and partners. This is why we organize these meetings. This is not a webinar. This is a meeting to do business. Thank you very much all the companies supporting, supporting or sponsor, and sponsoring our event today. Also, I would like to remind you that exactly at five o'clock when this meeting finishes at five o'clock, you will get a link in the chat. All you have to do is click on that link, close Zoom, and you will appear in a new environment in which you will be a bubble traveling in a screen and you will get to know people. This meeting is for people to get to know people, experience it. Even if you only have five minutes at five o'clock, try it, it is totally worth it. And the last thing I wanna to say to you is that we are live in YouTube. So I hope you're looking your best. Hello, YouTubers of the world. Thank you very much for joining today. If you want to get in touch with any of the participants, send me an email, jose.pozo at epic-asoc.com, and I will be more than happy to make the introduction. And this is, of course, also valid for the people in the Zoom room here with me. Use the internal chat to talk to each other during the presentations. Use it, abuse it, talk to each other. I want you to do business. At five o'clock, we will find a way to get to know each other. And if after the meeting, you didn't get a chance to talk to that company that you think could be your potential supplier, customer, and partner, send me an email and I love making the introduction. It took eight minutes to make this introduction, but I love every minute of it. I hope you listen to it because I, th I think I made you a little bit excited, but not half as excited as our first speaker is going to make you. We go to the Netherlands. We go to Nordvik. We go to the European Space Agency. Soran Sodnik, Senior Optical Engineer from Space Agency. Thank you very much for being with us. I really love welcoming Isa here because I live in Nordvik myself, so it's just behind these roll-ups. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to the most important EPIC member in space, goes to European Space Agency. The floor is yours. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you very much, Jose. Well, um, yeah, my name is Zoran Sotnik. We need to go um, to a slideshow mode. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Yes, perfect. Perfect. 
Okay, my name is Aaron Sotnik and uh, well, I'm the optical, te optical communications technology manager here in uh, the European Space Agency in the Telecom and Integrated Applications Directorate. And I will introduce you to the Skylight program that uh, some of you may not know, which is a dedicated program to uh, foster and to support industry and academia in Europe and Canada for optical communications, quantum key distribution and secure communications and photonics. So I think uh, I'm talking to the right audience here. Uh, let me give you first a little bit of an overview of the Skylight budget that uh, member states have contributed to. And you see it, it amounts at the moment to about 173 million euros. And uh, whichever country you, you live in, you can actually look at the, the contribution uh, from, from all those countries. Now, what are we targeting? What is Skylight actually uh, supporting and developing? And uh, mainly it is space and airborne optical communication terminals. So we want to reduce the cost of those. We want to uh, increase volume capacity. We want to make uh, size, weight and power and cost of course smaller. We standardize, we uh, look at different applications like multiple satellite communication ranging time and frequency transfer. But we also look at reliable transmission technology through the atmosphere. So looking at adaptive optics, at turbulence compatible modulation coding schemes, feeder links and optical ground stations. So if you are working in one of those topics, on one of those topics, the uh, European Space Agency is maybe a good partner for you to, uh, to, uh, to show us your uh, ambitions. And I will later show you how uh, we can support you. Now, we also do a quantum key distribution and we will hear, a, uh, I understand also a presentation about quantum key distribution. Uh, topics there are high brightness photon sources, high performance single photon detectors, quantum memories, quantum protocols, but general, and I think this is what EPIC is about, photonics in general, on digital optical communication, on analog, communication, integrated photon sources, photonic phased arrays. If it has to do with space, if it deals with optics, I think uh, you should talk to us and uh, I think uh, there can be some, uh, some partnership there. Now, for you, it's probably important to understand how to apply to get a grant from, from the agency. There are two basically different ways. The first one is a roadmap and a work plan that is published every year. And it tackles a little bit risky, critical technologies. And they are funded 100% because we understand that there is no, not necessarily an immediate market and they need quite a bit of uh, support financially in order to get started. Those activities, they are um, initiated by ESA. So you have to look at the ESA webpage via ESA star. And in my last slide, I will give you the, uh, the connection. But also, and, and as I said, these work plans are issued once per year. And uh, on ESA, on the website, you can see what is uh, currently uh, on offer. But there's also a second possibility that you propose your own activity and you can do that anytime you want. And it's always open. You have to have a business case and you only get up to 75% funding, but you can actually initiate any activity that you find important and necessary for your business. We're also supporting demonstration missions to showcase uh, things and, 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 and uh, building up industrial capabilities and there can also be 100% funded. Which already brings me to my last slide actually. The work plan that I was mentioning about is uh, released via this um, website, which I'm sure you are not able to, 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 to uh, write down so quickly. So my, if you send me an email to zoran.sotnik at isa.int, I'm more than happy to guide you through the process. We also organize Skylight workshops. They take place every year, not last year due to COVID, but uh, we make the next one in June this year virtual, unfortunately. 
And uh, well, having said that, I think uh, I'm looking forward to receive some some proposals from from you, from you, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for telling us about the potential opportunities for collaboration. I want to find some of these potential opportunities. This meeting is about finding connections. So let's uh, ask, we have, of course, any question in the room is totally welcome, but I would like to clarify with you some of the points that we have uh, in the technology portfolio. So if there are any questions from the room, please say so in the chat. And the first question is coming all the way from Switzerland. It's coming from CSEM. Amir, what's on your mind? Yeah, thank you. Actually, it's quite yeah, it's a very interesting discussion. Actually, I'm wondering about this you know, sort of a bottom-up uh, funding scheme that you have. Is it different? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Is it any different than OZIP program, this open space innovation program? Is it yes. something different yes, or is indeed. it the same thing? No, no, no. Uh, OZIP is completely different. It's um, it was actually composed from uh, from internal studies and uh, from a program called ITI. And um, normally in OZIP, the proposals come from inside of ESA. And they can be any, they don't have to be optical communications related. They can be anything related to space. So um, I think in OZIP, you also have some support to students to do their PhDs. You have uh, multiple activities that you can start, but it's not dedicated to optical communications or quantum key distribution. Okay. And also the grant is uh, clearly much, much smaller or the funding is much smaller than you that you can get. Mm -hmm. I hope that, that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We see a lot of uh, laser-related space communication. This is not new. And actually, we have many presentations today to deal with that topic. But I can see also that we are talking about wavelength division multiplexing. This is for free, for free space communication in satellites. And what kind of... Uh, what kind of wavelength range are we talking about? And this is, does it really collide with the WDN and the WDN regimes of the data, the terrestrial telecommunication the terrestrial. networks? Well, ideally, in order to uh, foster or to make use of the synergy with ground-based uh, equipment, we are using the same ITU grid or want to use the same grid. Of course, uh, we have to observe some uh, implication issues in, in spacecraft, how to separate the two wavelengths, what to transmit, what to receive. But in principle, we want to use both the, the C-band or and the L-band, which, which are both around uh, 15, 15 nanometers. But in addition to that, we're also looking, and we're not excluding that, we're also looking in WDM at 1064, around 1064 nanometers. Um, the issue, the reason being that it has a much better, not much better, but quite a bit better wall plug efficiency. So the efficiencies of amplifiers are better. Uh, the link budget is better because of the shorter wavelength. So we're not excluding one over the other, but we're strongly looking also in the terrestrial uh, WDM range, absolutely. I really very much like that you are on one hand talking about the, the using as a new space using technology that really validated terrestrially, but also looking at the 1064 nanometers. We have lots of different solutions there. I would like to ask, do we have a question in the room about, uh, it's an anonymous question, but they wonder, perhaps I missed the time scale over which this will all take place. Do you have some ideas about the time scale for some of these bullet points in the Skylight project? <laughs> Well, uh, if it's a, an ESA initiated activity, which is published in the work plan, and I'm happy to share those activities which are currently published in the work plan, uh, then uh, if the ITT or the invitation to tender is out, then you will find a deadline until which you have to apply. You can ask for an extension, but it will be granted for one or two weeks. So it is imminent. It is now, it is, uh, if, it's, if it's published. If you are prepared to uh, pay at least 25% of the funding yourself and you have a business case, you can, uh, as I said, apply anytime you like. You will have to write an outline proposal, which will be evaluated at least on paper within two weeks. This is what we, what we say we can do. And then you will be either invited to, to write a full proposal or it will be rejected. But this normally is very rarely happened, unless you, you propose something which we really don't think is worthwhile to pursue. 
the question was from uh, Greg Flynn from, from, from FICONTECH. Sorry, I couldn't see that it was from you. But Greg, would you like to comment on this? Do you have any further question regarding that, Greg? Um, thank you, Jose. I guess my uh, the only additional question I have is, so it's the project proposer, the organizer, that defines the time frame over which the, the work, the business case should be completed. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. In the old days, we used to uh, we used to to uh, tell people how long the, the activity has to last. Now we ask the companies how long they think it it needs to uh, it needs to last. Yes. Thank you. I oh, want. To... By, by the way, I would like to uh, kind of uh, water the wine a little bit because it may not be clear. You have to, for all skylight or artists or telecom activities, you have to have support from your delegation. So all these activities you have to kind of arrange with your delegation, with your local delegation, and they have to write a support letter that they support the activity. That's, that's important. Otherwise, ISA cannot uh, grant the activity. I cannot let you go without asking you about one of my passions, which is mm -hmm. adaptative optics. I love seeing adaptative optics here. Do you have some uh, further uh, thing to give? Because I have a few companies in the room, like Imaging Optic and Fasix, which I think they could be interested about this. Oh, yes. Well, um, I mean, for, for, for optical feeder links, you know, for every... Uh, optical communication system that has to go through atmospheric turbulence. Adaptive optics is if you want reliability and if you want 24-7 uh, operation, which in most cases you want, is a must. So uh, we are doing a lot of adaptive optics technology, also pre-distortion, uh, which I don't want to go into details now, but it's all using adaptive optics. I have one of the key companies in the sector in the room. I have Marshall from Imaging Optic. I have to give you the floor now. Does it resonate with you? And do you see here some room for cooperation? Yeah, thank you, Jose. Uh, let me uh, explain a little bit our uh, uh, main activity. Yes, we, we are specialists in uh, adaptive optics and uh, wavefront sensors. So adaptive optic looks is our main business for 20 years. So uh, maybe I can contact you as a run for uh, maybe our proposal for the cooperation uh, in, the, in the future. So we, we are also, yeah, in contact with uh, ESA, ESA, but uh, yeah, so for some, for some small pro projects. But now, yeah, it would be interesting to, to talk to you uh, about your project and what we can do for you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Congratulations on all the activities in Wavefront Sensors and also on Imaging Eyes bringing this to ophthalmology. I want to see more, more adaptive optics in space. We have a question for you, Soran, coming from one of the companies that is on the news now constantly. The, the, company, the photonic company in the news is 26. Robert, thank you very much for being with us today. What's on your mind? We can't hear Robert, but Robert is wondering about consortiums or initiatives for validation of uh, radiation hard electronics and optics in space. Uh, when it comes to electronics, then uh, it's not really my cup of tea because this is tackled by other experts. Um, I mean, of course, whatever we fly, it has to be qualified. But uh, if it is a special development in order to qualify uh, radiation hardened electronics, then this would not be a skylight activity. When it comes to optics in terms of uh, darkening of glasses or fibers and this, uh, definitely, if it is something that uh, needs to be, uh, that is missing, that needs to be technology that needs to be developed, it's Skylight. Please, I want to hear about. So I would like to tell Robert from 26 that the key company in Europe to do this is not a consortium, it's a company, is Thales Alenia Space. Talent is in the space, the company that helps any other company validate technology for space. Actually, I believe do we have Thales Alenia Space in the room. Anybody from Thales Alenia Space with us today? Yes. Hello, Bacuria. Federico. Hey, Jose. I cannot reply directly because this activity is performing in space in Toulouse. Mm -hmm. So I can give the contacts, but this is, we are in Zurich and we are not dealing uh, directly with this activity. In one of our previous meetings, we had one of your colleagues from Toulouse actually explaining this, that it was very clear to us. So anybody who needs this, please uh, contact Federico and he will introduce you. We have one more question, the final question for you, Soran, coming okay. from one of our key companies in optical filters and coatings, Iridian. Jason, what's on your mind? 
Oh, uh, uh, thanks, Jose. I was just uh, responding to a question that I saw about asking about the supply chain of 1064 versus uh, 1550 nanometers from the from the optical filter perspective. Um, at least uh, Iridium's completely wavelength agnostic. We're we're happy to work in the with the WDM in the 1550 region. Lots of terrestrial experience there, but also lots of experience in 1064, you know, 900 nanometers right down into the visible. So. Um, uh, we, we are, we're, we're not the kind of company that will be proposing a, 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 um, a work package to work on, but we're here and available uh, over these wavelength ranges to support uh, needs as they arise. Thanks. What a way for starting the meeting, Soran. Stay with us, stay tuned, because you can't imagine what's coming. All of you, you are now fully energized. We had Isa. Let's continue with this fantastic meeting. Today's I have something very, very good to announce. Our second speaker, is the director and co-founder of Access.Space, which is the association for the validation of optical communications in space. He has all the companies that are interesting as customers for our members to reach the space industry. So for us, it is a huge opportunity. Christian van der Rop, thank you very much for being with us today. And most important, thank you for having signed the Memorandum of Understanding that bring together access space and epic for all of members all our members to benefit to benefit by connecting to each other christian thank you so much thank you very much jose um let me start sharing my screen so i hope you can see my screen now okay so yeah thank you very much uh, for joining this session um and also to epic for this opportunity to speak um, my name is uh, Christian von der Rop. I'm a co-founder and company director of the Exo Space Alliance, a uh, global industry association of the small satellite industry and, and the wider new space ecosystem, currently uniting 49 uh, companies and organizations from around the, the globe. Um, it is my great pleasure to announce together with you that uh, EPIC and Exo Space have signed a memorandum of understanding to collaborate as part of which we intend to uh, bring together the memberships of both organizations um, to harness existing ecosystems and unlock opportunities in the new space sector for uh, all of our members. Um, this partnership is initially focused uh, on but not limited to laser communications and um, before our member Mineric and others will cover the technical details, uh, I would like to spend the next few minutes with a rather broader uh, overview of where this technology comes from, where it stands today, and uh, what the drivers um, are behind it. So j just uh, in terms of terminology, um, I'd like to clarify that um, a number of terms, which although you could argue about the nuances are all uh, used synonymously. Uh, so free space optical communications is probably uh, the more academic term for uh, what I will refer to as, as laser communications hereafter. So, um, what is this um, uh, all about? Um, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, f first let me mention we, we have formed a um, um, working group. So in, in early 2020, Exospace has has uh, formed the Free Space Optical Communications Committee or EFSA, uh, which is bringing together the supply chain and vendors of laser communication terminals with existing and future operators um, of the same. So um, laser communications is, is based on the very same technology as, as fiber optic communications over which uh, most of, of our internet traffic, uh, including this very call, is, is being carried today. Uh, with one little but decisive difference, instead of a fiber optic cable, the transport medium of laser communications is the air or um, the vacuum in case of space. Um, Actually, when in 1960 the laser was invented, uh, the first ideas were indeed to use it for communication applications, um, given that uh, Alexander Graham Bell had already demonstrated eight years earlier his, his uh, so-called photophone, which modulated a voice signal onto a light beam and transmitted it over a distance of, of 80 meters. So um, as a matter of fact, the first wireless telephone call was carried by light. Um, however, laser links through the air suffer from, from a number of limitations. Um, they require a clear line of sight between the terminals. They're prone to weather-related outages, uh, particularly rain um, and fog, and, and uh, the terminals must be aligned uh, uh, very precisely. Uh, so, when shortly after the invention of the, the laser, um, Charles Kayo invented the optical fiber, 
uh, the attention quickly shifted to fiber cables, which avoid all the, the mentioned issues. So in, in recent years, uh, the interest in laser communications has, has revived, um, particularly to the, due to the emergence of a private uh, space sector known as, as um, new space. Uh, so on the one hand, we have more and more Earth observation and remote sensing satellites gathering terabytes of data up on each um, orbit, which, which they simply cannot beam down to Earth uh, from their low orbits, given the limited radio spectrum and the short downlink windows they have while they overfly ground stations. So already today, we, we have a bandwidth bottleneck between satellites and the ground. Uh, then there are plans for large satellite constellations of hundreds up to thousands of uh, broadband communication satellites in low Earth orbit, uh, such as OneWeb or SpaceX Starlink, Amazon's Project Kuiper, and so far and so on. And uh, only yesterday, uh, the South Korean Hanwha Group has announced another constellation of um, 2,000 satellites. Um, because all these constellations partly or, or even fully share the same radio frequency spectrum, so very different from terrestrial telecoms where you have exclusive frequency allocation, uh, there's an increasing risk of harmful interferences. Under the ITU regulations, which follow the, the first come, first served principle, the later entrant must avoid interferences to earlier fired constellations, which is forcing future constellations to, to avoid the radio spectrum where possible. Um, apart from the need for, for more spectral bandwidth um, to increase our data rates, um, the, the interest in laser communications is also supported by the lower probability of detection and intercept as well as a jamming resistance resulting from the, from the nature um, of the narrow laser beam, which is why there's also a strong interest um, from, from the uh, defense community. Um, as mentioned, the radio spectrum is already heavily congested, often subject to lengthy licensing procedures and high licensing fees. Fees are it's prone to, to interferences and, and the increasing need for um, terrestrial radio applications and um, the associated uh, spectrum causes competition for radio spectrum. So only last year, the, the uh, satellite industry has more or less voluntarily given up 300 megahertz of, of spectrum in the C bands around 3.6 um, gigahertz, which has been reallocated to terrestrial 5G applications. Um, so comparing the available radio spectrum uh, to the amount of spectrum in the, in the optical range highlights the huge potential of, of laser comms. Um, there's around 600 times more bandwidth available in the optical domain than in the RF spectrum. Um, and all that spectrum is, is unlicensed, meaning there is no need for authorization and, and no uh, licensing fees apply. So the optical domain is, is uh, completely unregulated. Um, so, where, where are laser communications likely to be deployed? Um, the, the, the primary use case is for intersatellite links, so between satellites in orbit. Uh, but because all the traffic, all the data traffic forwarded from satellite to satellite has to eventually come down to Earth, it is also unavoidable to use laser for uh, so called direct to Earth links where the satellite communicates directly. Uh, with an um, uh, optical ground station. Um, due to the limited time, I, I'm, I'm skipping through the following slides that give a few examples for existing and future applications um, of uh, laser comms. Uh, but my slide deck uh, will be made um, available for download um, for those interested. Of course. So um, the, the challenges of the industry are on the one hand of technical nature, particularly um, the precise pointing acquisition and tracking of the laser terminals, which you achieve by a gimbal or for the CubeSats by what's called body pointing. So um, changing the, the attitude of the entire satellite. Um, then uh, the, the, the challenges go on with um, mitigating atmospheric turbulences by adaptive optics um, and also increasing data rates while at the same time reducing the size of laser terminals um, to fit on the increasingly small satellites, which uh, today are in the size of, of a fridge. Um, and on the other hand, um, there are also commercial challenges. So um, the cost of laser terminals is, is still uh, relatively high. So in the mid six digit range of, of euros or US dollars, which, which poses a barrier to, to wider uh, adoption. 
And the reason uh, for, for the high cost is, is um, the still low production volumes uh, involving manual labor. Uh, however, thanks to several commercial and government projects of very large scale involving orders for potentially thousands of laser communication terminals, uh, the technology is really at the brink of, of a wider proliferation of, of commercialization and, and accompanied by a switch to, to scale production. And, and our member, uh, Mineric, for example, is, is specializing exactly in this. So uh, really going into mine production, I always say it's, it's uh, what Henry Ford did uh, more uh, than 100 years ago uh, with, with the you know, starting line production of the automobile is, is now happening in this industry as well. So um, in, in parallel to the um, size and weight restrictions of, of uh, satellite, um, um, the, the uh, other challenge is, is really to um, yeah, achieve miniaturization and, and that, that can only be done by a higher degree of, of uh, integration, particularly with the photonic integrated circuits. So you're actually uh, talking about photonic integrated circuits as a one key technology. We do have lots of companies here who want to help your members, uh, but I'm curious, uh, when it comes to photonic integrated circuits, and of course, all this light deck will be shared with all the participants. When it comes to photonic integrated circuits, are there, are there any activities already for in access space for the space validation of this technology? Well, we're not going down into that technical detail. Uh, at this stage, Access Space is really working on, on the uh, partnership front, so bringing together the parties and the other um, field which we are addressing is really also the standardization, um, the standardization of the um, optical interface of the uh, actual communications protocol. There have been some um, uh, efforts in the past, CCSDS, um, now the, the, the US government through the Space Development Agency is proposing the OISL, so the Open Intersatellite Link Protocol, um, where they've adapted priests from CCSDS. But we, we have the, the, the belief um, that industry should eventually lead standardization because it's only industry that will make the best trade-offs between capabilities and costs and uh, manufacturing. Is, is super important. But what is even more important is that we help the photonic companies reach space technologies. So we have Absolutely. one company, I'm going to give you one example, one company in Switzerland who makes photonic integrated circuits, silicon nitrate based photonic integrated circuits. I, I think I have the, the, direct, uh, the managing director, Michael Hazelman with us. Michael, are you with us? Yes. Hello, Jose. Um, you, you, we have here Access Space, we have the European Space Agency, we have TESAT, we have Minaric, we have Airbus. You, have, you provide photonic integrated circuits. How do you see this as a business opportunity? So, so the, the PIX is, is definitely in, in space as, well, you, you, are, you are the experts in space. Every weight is, uh, is, is cost. And so, so if you want to to go down in cost, uh, pick uh, a pick is is uh, is the best uh, solution. And here we have uh, so what what we offer is is, uh, is a technology that is space compatible. That uh, we have done uh, radiation uh, tests on 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 silicon nitride with without any any observable change and we can we can support very high power levels on uh, on these uh, photonic integrated circuits which uh, which is most likely needed if you go into optical communication so here it's really um, what we would need on and, and what in this meeting what I'm, why I'm here is, is the specifications what uh, what um, what specifications do you need for for picks in, in space I want to address that after we hear from Tessat later in the program. I actually had it in my notes to so exactly ask for that. But uh, Christian, uh, I want you now to, because you brought friends and you brought one key company, which we love. I think you, you also my opening video, which we love. And I want you to introduce them. Please take the floor to introduce Access Space Epic member Minaric. Yeah, so uh, great pleasure. Um, Right after me, Mineric, uh, Mineric's Manfred Leipold will be presenting. Um, Mineric, as I mentioned, is uh, one of the leading companies in developing um, laser communication terminals. They are uh, based in Gilchen, close to, to uh, Munich. Um, they are a listed company in, in the German stock market um, and one of the pioneering companies um, leading a couple of very important um, 
uh, initiatives and, and also part of uh, the, the SDA program that I mentioned, so uh, the US government satellite constellation. So uh, I'll leave the floor to Manfred and uh, thank you again. Looking forward to uh, work with you and um, unlock value for all of our members. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I go ahead? Yes, please. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Christian, uh, for this nice introduction. Um, Manfred Leipel, my name. I'm leading the team Future Technologies at Mineric, which I joined uh, four and a half years ago. And uh, I will talk a bit about industrial industrializing laser communication for mass utilization in space and in the air. And um, jumping ahead to my next slide, you see actually some of our mature products, which we are delivering as we speak. Actually, there's high pressure uh, these weeks to deliver to the United States. There is Condor, which is the, our intersatellite link terminal flying in, designed to fly in, in low Earth orbit, uh, 10 gigabits per second intersatellite inter link data rate. We are also working in parallel on the Hawk terminal for aeronautical application flying on high altitude platforms and the aircraft uh, also designed for 10 gigabits per second data rate, uh, air to air and air to ground communication. So those are our mature flight products. And besides that, we have uh, prototype uh, development units for ground stations. You see Rhino on the left-hand side uh, for satellite to ground and Armadillo, another ground station, 200 millimeter aperture for air to ground. So that's uh, our product line. And uh, as Christian pointed out, uh, I think um, this, and I've seen the evolution over the last uh, four or five years, we are really going to serial production and we have significantly ramped up our in-house test capabilities uh, Actually, I was involved in the thermal vacuum chamber procurement. So we do significant uh, test campaigns for space. We have an, um, a shaker test stand, which you don't see here. And we do lots of in-house optical and electrical testing, RF testing. And this is uh, extended, as you see at the, at the bottom, the middle bottom side, by extensive uh, outdoor flight campaigns. Some of our terminals are mounted on, on the lower end of this, like this gondola on a fighter aircraft. And we were able to demonstrate a stable one G link from a, from a fighter airplane. So it's really exciting stuff, quick turnaround, quick testing cycles. And yeah, we are expanding also in space, lab space. Um, the growing team, uh, I. I'm fairly proud to say that now we, we are 200 people strong. We have, um, we have engineers from 39 nations actually, and this is really uh, something which enriches uh, the company. Uh, actually tomorrow, another eight engineers will join the company and you will also see Japan listed uh, in, in our color. And we are constantly growing. Um, on, on the three sites, uh, the headquarters in Gilking, close to Munich, where we do most of our engineering and, and production. Uh, we have a headquarters in the United States, Los Angeles, uh, Sales USA, and some engineering is starting up there. And we recently opened a sales office in Washington DC, which you might have seen on the news. And we are, for those out there who are talents in engineering, um, apply now. We are still hiring and we are still increasing. By the end of the year, we will be close to 300 in Mineric. Yeah, and that's my favorite um, chart. Um, that's what I spent uh, day and night on. Enabling technologies for future laser comm terminals. Um, we are working actively and then we are investing several million euros per year of R&D budget. So we work a lot on optical sensors, high sensitive uh, receivers and front-end electronics up to 100 gigabits per second. This is mainly 
to extend the range between flying terminals, uh, also for the inter-satellite link, of course. And we are on a very good way with an external partner to extend the range between the, the terminals significantly by increasing the gain factor by 10 or 20 times what you see now on the market. I can say this. <laughs> Photonic crystals, another area uh, we are investigating to focus, uh, to uh, funnel light into our high sensitive uh, detectors. We do a lot of radiation campaigns, radiation testing of COTS parts triple E parts, uh, boards, uh, as well as optical components um, to save money, uh, to qualify certain commercial parts for space. And uh, every two months, roughly, there are radiation campaigns. So if there are some components out there which you think uh, you could contribute to Minerics uh, endeavors, uh, let me know, yeah. Efficient, and optical, uh, efficient optical amplifier is another area where we are progressing. And uh, non-mechanical beam steering, which you see on the right-hand side, uh, optical phased areas, uh, that's a project we recently started. So if you think uh, you have good ideas, uh, good technologies, uh, sub-assemblies, uh, parts even, let me know and we could possibly team. Uh, we are open for that. And as some of you might know, we have been working for the last uh, four years on nano terminals, something like, not really as small as, uh, as you see in the image here, but uh, one to 1 1.5 kilogram laser terminals, mainly flying on aircraft and high altitude platforms for air to air communication at one gigabits per second. And that's why you see down there, your idea, um, we uh, invest a lot in future technologies in the end to save money. And if you have uh, brilliant ideas, um, come up with it and contact Maneric. We are open for it. Thank you so much for this. And thank you for all the range of possible, possible opportunities. It is your first ever EPIC meeting, but definitely will not be the last. <laughs> I have the EPIC question for you. This is my goal welcoming you to the network. What can you do for the almost 700 photonic companies behind me? And what can they do for you? Please select one or two photonic challenges. I'll find you the solution. <laughs> um... DWDM, uh, we, are, we are doing some work in, uh, in that area, uh, going from 10G to 50G. A uh, colleague of mine in, in, uh, in the area of future tech, um, she's working heavily in, in that area, combining our sensor technology, the, the new 10G sensor with uh, some grating technology. So WDM is, is a topic. And if someone out there has good ideas, uh, we are happy. We, we have prototypes which are not yet fully working. And uh, so we, we are open for other technologies. We, we love DWDM. We love that. You cannot imagine how many meetings organized on that topic. But you are talking about 1064 nanometers, right? Not really. Uh, okay. We are focusing on 50, near 1550. Okay, so telecom wavelengths. Uh, all right, fantastic. I have a lot of potential operations, uh, cooperations with you. Let me start. Timing. Timing is one of your challenges. I'm sure of that. We have a company, Time Tag Space, in the room who wants to help you solve those challenges. Martin, how can you help Manfred? Let's do some business today. Okay, hi. Thanks. Thanks for this amazing event. Thanks for the chance to... Thanks for this amazing background. I love it. <laughs> I, I love it too. I love it too. Uh, essentially, we specialize in high precision picosecond precision timing, in time tagging more specifically, and we've built the first standardized system of its type for use in space with the help of ESA, of course, um, and we are looking for opportunities to use it for optical communications, potentially deep space with PPM and the likes, and I would like to see if you have some places, some needs which we can address with such a technology. Thank you. Manfred. Yeah, let's let's chat. Let's uh, let's get in touch. Um, very interesting. Um, 
whenever you have a, a good idea, I, I might involve uh, our CTO and let's let's explore it. Yeah. As, as I said in the intro video, let's talk. And let's also talk to one of the key companies in Epic on the photonic device manufacturing. They are in the news everywhere. Marty, let's try again. Robert from 26, what's on your mind? Yes, now it works. Robert, tell us. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Perfect. So, so two questions. The first one is related to interoperability. And I think this comes from a lot of us that think of a background in access networks, right? Uh, pawn based architectures, where we ended up with kind of walled gardens of technology as people deployed piecemeal around the world. What's Moneric doing to avoid that? I mean, do you, are there standards you follow? And then the second one is very specific on, on the network architecture. Is it point to point for mesh networks or all optical? What's on, the, what's on your mind? Okay, I can tell you that this is a topic we, we have addressed quite a while ago um, uh, for the inter-satellite link. So we have a group of, I think, three people in-house who, who are um, uh, working in, in that area. I, I'm not the expert there. I cannot give you too much detail. But of course, this is something uh, we are investigating for routing of, of signals. Uh, but we are focusing mainly on the on the inter, inter-satellite links in orbit. Um, maybe if this answers your questions. But we we are working on this uh, with a small group uh, which look, looks at the whole system architecture. Yeah? It's not just uh, this one-to-one -one communication, but uh, in our baseline scenarios with the platform providers we work with, uh, typically, we have four, four of our laser terminals on the satellite platform, uh, two for the in-plane and two for the east-west uh, communication. That's why in some of the images you see on our webpage, you see four identical uh, Condor terminals being mounted on, on the platform. And that's, that's our typical scenario uh, to keep the mesh uh, and the link in orbit in, in place. If I may add to this uh, just briefly, um, so I think the, the, the Pentagon, uh, the Space Development Agency with its um, current procurement program for the so-called transport layer is, is pretty much leading as a larger sponsor the standardization process. And the, the um, draft standard is actually public. So if you go to their website, sda.mil slash transport, you'll find a sheet with uh, what the uh, scenario looks like. And it basically adopts the ITU grid for DWD. Christian, please feel, feel free to put the, the, the link in the chat. This is the, the, okay. the beauty of these online meetings. We can share this information live. Manfred, when you talk to me about telecom wavelengths, I got goosebumps. Uh, I want you to hey, meet that's good. a you, friend you of mine. Talk. I yeah. want you to meet a friend of mine. I'm going to go to a company in Akin. It's called Ficon Tech, and they are helping the manufacturing of integrated photonics in, in all over the world by doing the active alignment. Greg, you had a really interesting question about satellites, but I also want you to share your story with Manfred. There is clear room for cooperation here. Um, thank you, Jose. Um, um, a quick question, Manfred. First of all, I, there, was a, there was a slide where um, you showed, I, I guess, your, your product development or maybe your, your manufacturing environment. Um, I guess my question is, is to what extent are you then only a process or a product development service or, or also a, a contract manufacturer or even a, a volume manufacturer? Yeah, I mean, we have um, inside Moneric, we have, say, we have two worlds. We have the products world where we, uh, as, I, as I've shown, uh, we focus fully on Condor and Hall flight terminals. And here we we are uh, going to really serial production. As you have seen in this one chart, we have production cells in place. And uh, recent, quite recently, we have extended our um, uh, facilities, lab, lab space and, and clean room space to really have one manufacturing cell right next to each other, to the other. So, so that's, um, that's the, the products world where we really go, uh, uh, supply chain supplying hundreds, thousands of uh, units, identical units, and there, and I've personally worked in that area. You can save lots of money, actually. Yeah. And then we have the the the, the prototyping, which is the R and D world, where I'm currently active, where we have ten sub assembly projects running in parallel, and. Of course, we're also looking at the packaging, uh, front-end packaging, uh, wire bonding, and those kinds of details. 
to make our sensors uh, really work um, uh, gain wise. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, uh, thank you, Jose, for switching in my slides. Um, I've given the, been given the opportunity to to give a one slide presentation about Falcon Tech. Um, two very quick points I would like to raise is one, thank you to, to the Epic team for this 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 format of meeting. This this brings obviously brings the right people with the right content, giving the right presentation to the right audience, to then also ask the right questions, and it's a really valuable format to us. So so thank you. Uh, second very quick point is that um, what you read on the screen here, Manufacturing Made Light, is our new mission statement that we're putting out. This is being aired for the first time. Within the context of what Ficantech does, I would be very interested to hear um, what, how people feel about this uh, mission statement. Please give me some feedback via the chat, via email afterwards. Um, this is my slide that's an overpopulated slide that demonstrates what Ficantech does. I assume you can see it. Um, Two very quick takeaways. Um, we are everywhere in the product development and production process workflow. We will even get involved with the device design, prototyping, of course, validating and testing, and all the way through up to high volume manufacture with end of line test. We have expertise and systems um, that will slot into any step along this workflow chain. Um, and the second takeaway is, 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 is the manufacturing convergence that the Fagentech sees. We've been involved in, in photonics enabled device manufacture for 20 years. We have 900 systems out in the field and, and, and through the trending technologies, or rather what we, what we have learned within that period of time, where we cut our teeth, for example, on telecom, datacom applications, making Tosa and Rosa devices for long haul data center, et cetera. We can apply all those skills we've learned to, to LIDAR, terrestrial or space applications, of course, as well, for high volume manufacturing, where we're doing that already in the telecom arena, and also now um, um, for, auto, for automotive applications in terms of air purity sensors, um, and even being able to draw on the experience that we have, being able to put together fully automated assembly systems for, for quantum device manufacture. That is the breadth of, and, and, and of, of where fighting tech can be active and, and drawing all those skills together is, is really um, what fighting tech is all about, being able to, to bring that all together to offer a package that is almost unequaled. Thank you, Jose. I hope that wasn't too long or... It was fantastic, like everything you do, Greg. Thank you very much for being with us. And everyone who sees a, a business opportunity with Ficon Tech, do it and you make me a bit happier because everybody who knows me knows that I feel especially, especially well with Ficon Tech being a member of Epic. We reach now one of the most interesting parts of the meeting. Manfred, stay tuned. We're going to hear from Donald about what his site is doing on the testing and validation for a space. And then we're going to hear the most exciting thing, Spire flying photonics into satellite. But first, Donald, thank you very much for being with us this morning for you, afternoon for me. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to the key testing company of Epic, Keysight. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning. I think there's a few of us here in the Hemisphere Online, so good morning to you. Let me share my screen here. Can you see that? Okay. Gorilla Glass Clear, the floor is yours. <laughs> Very good. I'm, I'm Donald Van I'm an application engineer here at Keysight Technologies. And in particular, I'm, I'm in the Space and Satellite Mission Assurance Group, uh, working with different space customers here uh, in, on the west coast of America and all around the world. And uh, what I want to do here today is um, I, I want to stay to my six minutes if possible, but I, I have a very large company to introduce. So I want to introduce Keysight to you. Um, we're the world's premier design, test, and measurement solution company, uh, over $4 billion in revenue. We're in the S&P 500 offices all around the world. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you have heard of, of Keysight. And uh, one of the reasons for that might be we've changed names a few times over the last few years. So you might be more familiar with, with these names. Of course, that's Hewlett and that's Packard there, uh, inventing the, the, this uh, audio oscillator that they, they, they built in 1939 to start Hewlett Packard Company. And um, so for years, 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 we were Hewlett Packard building test and measurement equipment for, uh, for electrical engineers. And um, of course, Hewlett Packard went into computers and printers. So we split off from them. And subsequent to that, we've split off once again 
uh, and so now we're Keysight Technologies. Um, personally, I, I think we should have kept the HP name because we're the closest to what Hewlett and Packard actually did. They don't ask me these things, but I'm very happy to be Keysight, of course. So if you've used Hewlett Packard products, you've, you're, you're probably familiar with what we do, which brings me to, uh, to the first part of the epic question, what can we do for you? Keysight technologies, if you think of uh, test and measurement equipment, oscilloscopes, network analyzers, multimeters, power supplies, things like that, that's all part of, of what we do. We have a very, very wide, broad product line. Uh, beyond that, just the physical bench equipment, we're, we're also known for our simulation and design software. So we can take you all the way from the simulation design of the product through the R&D testing and the verification, and in some cases, all the way up through manufacture where we can actually build the product for you. Um, as technologies become more and more complex, of course, our, our offerings become more complex. We have channel emulators to simulate Doppler, simu uh, 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 Doppler shift, other uh, um, uh, uh, factors that you might encounter in your transmission chain. Uh, we do network testing where we're testing uh, uh, security over IP networks. We're testing protocol and load uh, over different networks. So again, a very broad product line, certainly far too broad for me to go into here today. So I wanna shine a spotlight on one particular division of the company, and that's the, our high-speed and photonics test division. They're based over there in Bobling in Germany, close to Stuttgart. I saw one of our guests, Christian, you're, you're in the Stuttgart area, so you might know very well where, where, where they're located there in, in Bobling. And they've been there for 40 years. And of course, as, as the name suggests, they're focused in high-speed products and photonic test products. Here's a, a brief timeline of uh, some of the technologies that they've been leaders in. Um, all the way from more simple products like power meters and precision tunable laser sources up through optical modulation analyzers where we can actually see into the signal and, and break down your BPSK, QPSK, whatever you have in there, um, up through component and lightwave component analyzers. It's very much like a network analyzer where we, we send in a stimulus and measure the response and test the characteristics of lightwave components. Beyond these test and measurement bench type, type products, they also have the Optical Technology Center there in Boblingen. And it's a manufacturing facility, a fairly small manufacturing facility that's gen, um, it, really its original purpose was to build parts for us, for our products. One of the things I like about being at Keysight is we have these technology centers at various places around the world because we need to develop R&D Without our products, so we can actually manufacture things that no one else has in their R&D test equipment. So, for example, our tunable laser sources rely on products that we build here at these manufacturing facilities, but we also do manufacturing um, for other companies here as well. So we've got very high precision equipment, um, pick in place, optimizing the assemblies and so forth for optical electronic assemblies, optical mechanical assemblies. There. Oh, sorry. So the, one of the reasons it really compelled me to, uh, to, to come visit today, these meetings are, I, I'm new to these meetings, but I got to say, these are great ideas. I'm, I'm really enjoying what I'm seeing so far. Um, we're involved in all these different technology areas, and, and you may, it may catch your attention there, 400G, 800G as, a, as a, 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 an area of, of, of great optical innovation there. Um, and we've always been involved there. We, we build some fantastic equipment for that technology area, but we haven't done as much. We're not as familiar uh, with the free space optical communications uh, um, equipment. And um, so what's different there? I know some people are flying satellites using 100G technology. There's some experiments going up with that. But for example, where we're very, very strong in, in, um, in 1300, 1550 nanometer technology, we're, we have the technology to do 1064, but we, we haven't really applied it uh, with customers yet. And so and on the epic question of what can you do for us, that's where I want to, uh, to work with you is to learn more. We have all the building blocks for what you would need for design, test, and measurement for your equipment, but uh, we need to apply it to specifically what you do. Um, 
I, I had a funny story a, a while back working with with uh, with JPL out here in Southern California. Of course, you know, JPL, the JPL Deep Space Network, they communicate with satellites that have been up there for 40 or 50 years. And so I went out to the customer site and he said he needed a, um, a source to be able to generate a signal. Uh, and he needed to communicate. I said, what's the communication rate? He says about four. And I said, so like four megabits per second. He said, no, four bits per second. That was the the lower end. At some At some points they need to communicate that slowly. And that was a real awakening to me. It's like, I really need to think more about what the application is. In this case, the perfect thing for the application was a very slow link. Sometimes it's a very fast link. I need to work with customers like you to find out more about those, uh, about those systems and tailor our products to, to what you need. And I think that was my last slide. And I think that was a fantastic last slide and a fantastic way of closing. Keysight is one of the key companies we have in the testing side for optical networks. But today, today is a space meeting. So I was very curious when, when we got the, the request from, from Keysight to be in this meeting because there's many companies who want to know things on optical network testing. There's a question for you in the YouTube universe. So I'm gonna to go to the YouTube universe and the question is coming from Ahmad Mustafa from Minaric, by the way, from yeah. Minaric. And they're wondering uh, what are uh, the modulation schemes and error correction codes that you normally see or that perhaps foresee for space optical networks? That's, you know, here I'm really following the lead of the people on this meeting. And by thank you so much, Mineric. By the way, I, I was just noticing the other day the Mineric headquarters in the United States is uh, is about four miles from me, just a little bit fur further in, in in Hawthorne. So I'll have to stop by some time, <laughs> stop by some time and say hello. Um, but I'm really following the lead of the people on this call. I've seen links that are designed more for rugged durability, BPSK, QPSK, uh, uh, links like that that, that operate at, um, at significant speeds. But then I've, I've also seen some very recent experiments lately, like what we have, uh, NASA has what the, they call the T-Bird project here and a few others where they're actually putting up commercial 100G, uh, very, very high throughput links on satellites to see if it'll work. And it, it's, um, and I think that's what's so exciting about this is, is we you want to follow the right lead? Because why don't we ask them? We had them here today. We can ask them. Do we have somebody from TESAT in the room? I think we have somebody from TESAT. Let me get him online. Matai, Matthias? Matthias, yeah, we here. got a question in the YouTube mm -hmm. universe from Minaric. They are wondering mm -hmm. about the standard or the followed modulation schemes and error correction codes typically used in space communications. Typically, um, there's not a typically that is, that is you, you need this uh, code, which is the most efficient for your for your communication chain, what you have chosen. So different suppliers have different methods to to close a link over over long over long range uh, and to have high data rates. So um, we have different uh, uh, approaches in these. Uh, though there's, there's not not a real um, uh, starting point. Um, uh, now in the in the SDA OISL inter interoperability discussion, uh, what we are facing is that uh, that now these these codings are coming together, and and uh, each supplier have to uh, somehow to explain why he did this or, or or using that code. You can you can may look also in the CCSDS uh, subject where where people are trying to to find the right way because at the end you have to to have a, an interoperability uh, between different vendors, which is good. So the, the market is, 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 uh, is coming now because we have these, uh, these uh, we, we could overcome the vendor lock. Yeah? So we are quite happy to see that the competition is, is coming and, uh, and that is really growing the market. So there is not a, a real answer on uh, what, what is, uh, we can recommend something. Of course, we, you can follow what TSAT is doing, uh, but uh, that is not a, a, a good way. So therefore look at the CCSDS standardization for the different applications. So which application are you looking for? Is it deep space? Is it, is it uh, a, a, a high photon flux like we do in 1064? Are you looking for 1550 downlinks? Uh, meanwhile, we have a lot of applications uh, in, in, the, in this market. 
We are going to go to Matias later. He gave us a preview with no spoilers because I've seen the slides of what he's going to tell us later. Matias, you're going to be speaking in a few minutes. But now mm -hmm. we go now to what everybody has been waiting for. At least me. I've been waiting for this presentation already for three months since Dan called me. Dan, thank you very much for being with us today. Spire takes the stage, the floor, and the attention of everyone is going all the way to space. The floor is yours. Yep, thank you. Let me see if I can uh, just share my slide. One second. I, I told you, it's a lot easier to do it in practice mode than yeah. in YouTube live mode. Yeah, I will manage. Build, you build it up so much that now I am, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little bit nervous. <laughs> I actually sugarcoated it. What I was going to say is like for every photonic company, the entire epic universe, if you're looking for the right partner to put your photonic device in orbit, there is nobody better in the whole world than the company that has 300 hours, 300 years of space time than Isaac. The floor is yours. Is that better? Yes, <laughs> that's a lot better. <laughs> Uh, I hope you can see my slides. Not yet. I was building it up, but not yet. We can't see it yet. Okay, so just one second. Um, yeah, I will um, go back to sharing mode. So share. Yes. Okay. We we'll get there. it there. We see your Mac and then, yes, the floor is yours. Perfect. Absolutely great. <laughs> Thank you, Jose, and I really want to thank Epic for, for this great opportunity. And also, I see that this, there's a huge crowd here that, uh, that, that is absolutely interested in what we're doing in space. And, uh, and we're very much interested in what, uh, what the Epic uh, group of companies is, is doing in space as well in terms of all the photonics applications. So we're super excited to, to participate in this event. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about Spire. So um, Spire was created uh, back in 2012 with a, with a dream to really use space to, to deliver impact to humanity. And um, our CEO, Peter Platzer, and, and the founders of the company, they wanted to generally make, make an impact in, in our society, even to the point of raising the GDP of the world by, by several percentage points. Um, with this crazy idea that, that, uh, that we can use nanosatellites in order to do that. So fast forward um, a few years from that, so from 2012 now to 2021, um, uh, we've gone from manufacturing a, a, a very small nanosatellite out of a, literally out of a garage to now uh, having launched uh, over 140 satellites and now having 110 currently in orbit delivering uh, global data and analytics. And in this next slide, uh, what we are really doing is, is monitoring the world on a 24 by seven basis. Um, our, our satellites have gone from um, what I would define as toys basically, to, to basically supercomputers in space with, with communications devices. And we use these supercomputers uh, to collect various different types of, of data. Um, number one, we have AIS receivers that allow us to track the world's um, uh, commercial uh, vessel fleet. Uh, so we've seen now several examples and one of them quite interesting about uh, vessels clogging up the Suez Canal. Uh, so we were, not a, we were able not only to track that vessel but also the tugboats that were supporting the relief operations of, uh, of uh, the Ever Given, a vessel stuck in the Suez Canal. But we're also, also tracking those vessels that are stuck uh, behind, that, behind that vessel now that are trying to go through the Suez Canal and, and those that are going beyond. So we're tracking the, we're tracking the world's vessel fleet on a continuous basis. Um, we are also carrying payloads that allow us to, to also monitor the, uh, the, the evolution of air traffic around the world with uh, ADSB receivers. So again, we, we track about 95% of the, of the, of the aircraft flying, flying today, and we can extract extremely valuable data analytics from, from that information in terms of um, the rise and fall of air traffic as a, as a, as a result of COVID-19 um, and many other different types of, of, of clever data analytics products that we commercialize to our, to our customers. And last but not least, and this is the one that excites me the most really, 
is, is all about um, um, atmospheric research. Um, our satellites use uh, GPS signals, uh, not necessarily for positioning, but primarily um, we use the refraction and reflection principles of, um, of waves going through a different medium to extract information about um, the atmosphere. So as a GPS signal or a Galileo signal goes through the atmosphere, it can refract. And that refraction is, a is, is directly related to um, how the, uh, the atmosphere is, whether it's hot, humid, cold, uh, and we can obtain that information uh, using a very small receiver on board of, of the satellite. And also as the signal bounces off the surface of the earth, we can also extract valuable information through the principles of reflection. We can uh, monitor the, uh, we can see whether um, we're, we're looking at oceans, whether we're looking at, 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 at the ground. And even with the ground, we can see uh, soil moisture. Um, because the reflection of GPS signals off the surface of, of, of a humid chunk of land is different from whether that, that piece of land is, is dry. Um, so we do this continuously. And our, our lemur satellites, uh, they're called lemurs because they are low Earth orbit multi-user uh, platforms. So they, they are designed specifically to carry uh, multiple payloads. And this includes not only our payloads, but it includes also customer payloads. So this is, uh, leads on to what, I would like to try and answer the question, what, what can we do for, for EPIC? So as I mentioned, we're not only able to carry uh, our payloads, but we can also carry customer payloads as well, um, be it to demonstrate uh, technology in space, uh, raise the TRL level of, of, of certain technologies, or go to the full deployment of a constellation of satellites carrying, uh, carrying these payloads. We, we have, um, uh, our, 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 our battle horse is, is the Lemur 3U satellite. It's a 3U nanosatellite, uh, basically 30 centimeters by 10 by 10, um, but it is, is extremely capable and can carry a small, small payloads, but we also have a 6U model that pretty much gives us up to four U of uh, payload carrying capacity. So that's what we, and that's what we call payload in space. This is a kind of a traditional hosted payload model. Um, but in addition to that, we, we, we produce what, what we call solutions in space. So we can work with partners within Epic to actually offer a complete end-to-end -end solution to a, to a customer by combining clever technology, new technology, um, exciting, and uh, groundbreaking technology from Epic members into our, into our chassis, into our, into our platform and delivering a full end-to-end -end data service to our customers. That's what we call, what we would call solution space. And last but not least, uh, we have 110 satellites in orbit. Um, for me, this is a, an infrastructure in space that we can leverage in order to deliver um, uh, applications to, to, to customers and they can upload their software onto our platforms and, and then create new services, new applications that they can then commercialize to their, to their customers. Um, we are also specialized in, in, in scaling and accelerating uh, business models. We've done it ourselves. Um, as you can imagine, the first models of our satellites were, were let's say crude or, and, and, and less capable than what we can do today. We've actually expanded um, several tenfold the ability to gather uh, gather data and process data um, without having to expand the number of satellites that, that is placed into orbit. So we use several techniques in order to um, um, continuously increase uh, in a, at an exponential level the amount of data that is produced by our payloads or by our customers' payloads without having to increase the footprint in space um, in a linear manner. So we have all kinds of techniques, cloud-based cloud operations and data processing, um, continuous payload uh, software updates that increase, just uh, continue to exponentially increase the capabilities of the payloads. Um, and, 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 and we deliver data to our customers and, or their customers to their customers through, um, through APIs. So if you have a, a, web, a web connection, a secure web connection, um, you can use an API to access the data that is provided by your payload. Um, and last but not least, uh, we offer a service. So 
we 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 charge the custom our customers based on a, on a flexible subscription model no more upfront costs or milestone based payments it's all about having a service and you pay for your service and and you pay on a monthly basis and it's as simple as that so um, I also want, would like to address what, what can Epic do for Spire? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we are continuously um, expanding in, into various different markets. As I said at the beginning, we believe that through technology, we can deliver impact to humanity. So we're always looking at what, is, what are the latest technological developments that give us a, a, an edge um, from the point of view of being able to communicate faster uh, and with higher throughput, of course. So this is what I would say we can use, of course, optical communications in order to enable uh, um, inter-satellite links between our satellites or reduce the data latency that, uh, that is an important matter for us. So uh, the value of data is directly uh, proportional to, um, to um, how fast we can get it down to earth. But at the same time, we're always on the lookout for new sensors um, perhaps optically based or laser type sensors that allow us to um, further expand our ability to monitor the atmosphere. Um, we're always in the, on the lookout for that. Um, I'm not an expert in that, in that domain, but anything that we can carry on board of our satellites that can allow us to, to monitor the atmosphere better and do better weather modeling, weather prediction, uh, we're always going to be interested in that. Um, and then, of course, any, any, any components um, that we can use in order to um, uh, further enhance the capability of our, of our nanosatellite platform, um, we are always as well on the lookout for that. We're super excited to work with any company that can, that can really bring us that competitive advantage, uh, whether it's optically based or not. Um, and um, just, just, <laughs> just in time. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I really like that you are just in time. Thank you so much, Dan, for this. And, you know, I wanted to tell you something. We work really hard at Epic, really, really hard. Actually, I'm going on holidays after this meeting finishes. I need it. And we actually have two new Epic members, as you can see here in this in this slide. We have two, two new Epic members that are helping also our members to bring photonics to airborne and spaceborne aircraft. So I would like to also say hello to Smart Hubs and Cefalto. Both of them can enable your photonic device to be on a hub or even on a balloon. And we also have Minaric to put it on a satellite. We are doing our best to make sure that our members get access to validate their technology all the way up there. Dan, you're going to allow me something, please. I'm going to go now to TESAT because I want to combine the two Q&As. You told us half of the story. I want to get the other half from TESAT, and then we combine this fantastic Q&A. Matias, thank you so much for representing TESAT at this meeting. It means really the world for us. We're going to have this presentation combined with the laser beam shaping needs of K-Labs. At first, let's hear from Matias from TESAT, the head of sales, laser communication. The floor and the attention of everyone is yours. Matthias, I think we may have lost connection. We may have lost satellite communication with TESAT at the moment. Matthias, one, two, three. Since we reconnect, we are going to reconnect to Matthias in a second. The show must go on. I love that part. Queen, here we go. Let's go now to Kylabs. Kylabs, uh, beam shaping, optical beam shaping. No, Matthias is with us. Matthias, are you with us? Yes, he's with us. He's muted. I love making these yeah. shows live. It makes me like so happy. Matthias, the floor yeah. and the attention of everyone goes to Tessat. Thank you. So I hope you can see my slides as well. Not yet. We are uh, waiting for them. So please, let's go. Uh, you, click, you click on the share slides, and then you have to confirm which screen you want to share with the world. Yeah, I did it. Let's try again. This one, this one. Okay, we still cannot see your go. slides. This one, share. Yes. All right, so we go to slideshow mode. Yeah, last time it didn't it didn't work, so uh, let's try it now. I'm sure. Yeah, will be better this time. Oh, 
No. Uh, I, I, we're going to do is, can you press F5? Yeah. You know what? The show must yes. go. Let's go with this format. Show us the slides like this. It's OK. See something now? This one? Yes. Let's see. OK, we are sharing them from our corner now. So you go uh, full presentation mode, slideshow mode. Yes, uh, we are going to share them from our side, Matthias. So please start okay. the presentation. OK. If you can share. If you can, oh yeah, right, cool. So yeah, thank you for this. So um, you know that TSAT is working a long time in the optical communication field um, since, uh, since since many many times, and we meanwhile have uh, different uh, designs made for different applications. So we started uh, with uh, with uh, a geo geo based data relay. The European data relay service is in in the air since 2016 in a commercial service. So the geo layer um, is made for laser com terminal with a bigger aperture. It's called geo LCT 135. The number. Uh, on the bottom uh, tells you the, the size of the of the aperture, so of op the optical head. And when when it when I come to the end uh, of the presentation, it's always that uh, uh, people like us uh, look for for a good trade between uh, size, weight, and power. And uh, in in the optics, you know that in the free space optics, everything goes with. Uh, uh, so transmission of, uh, of, of photons, so how to collect photons over a long distance. Uh, when, when, I, when I talk to the GeoGeo, Geo, we have 80,000 kilometers to, to transmit. Um, currently, we do that with, uh, with 1.8 gigabit over 80,000 kilometers. And that is really the first uh, backbone, um, the backbone network for, for middle SATCOM users, uh, people who would like to have an, an, a backbone, optical backbone in the sky. Um, then the second one here is a LEO-based uh, terminal, LEO Smart 70. So it's half size of the aperture, so 70 millimeter. Um, and that is then the, the counterpart of the GEO for the data relay. So we can do optical in the satellite links 1.8 gigabit over 45,000 kilometer. And we see screen ones, that is the basic for, for Copernicus, for the ESA programs, for the Sentinels. Um, uh, so a lot of, of the Sentinel 1A, one, one 2A, 1B, one 2B, two, two and so on are flying uh, with, uh, with Lasercom. We are performing 1,000 links per month. So it's a, it's a real reliable technology. With that, we went then to the to the middle part of that, so the CON LCT, which we call the Constellation Terminal CON LCT 80. So our aperture is 80 millimeter. Uh, and that's good then for, for five, 5 gigabit, 8,000 kilometer, 10 gigabit, 6,000 kilometer. Um, and we see that now in the in US, in the US market. So a, a high run for this product. Um, we are in, in uh, uh, yeah, uh, in, in at the moment, we are contracted for for three different programs here, and uh, we are in the in the procurement phase uh, of that. And you will you will see us fly uh, in 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 this in in uh, with the delivery in this year. Uh, Though that's very very progressing and very um, very exciting that we are we are part of the uh, of the U.S. government programs. Uh, and uh, on the lower level, um, we have then uh, together with, uh, with the atmospherical links, uh, so a cube LCT, for example, and, and all the atmospherical downlink systems. Uh, we, do, we have a cooperation with the German Space Agency, with DLR, uh, to, uh, to have products for uh, downlink um, in the in 1550 on-off keying systems. Uh, also, air to air uh, is our subject. So everything, um, and I think, yeah, it is it is right to say that we have the strongest portfolio in air. Could you go to the next slide? So in terms of that, uh, and, and and that is uh, should be encouraging all for all all people who are joining this forum here. You can you can earn money with Lasercom. Uh, that's good. Yeah. So we do a. We have a high revenue, uh, 300 million 
done in the last years with laser products in force free space optics in space. Uh, the number of optical inter-satellite links are growing permanently, so 1,000 links. So if you have to, to fight for a business case in your company to say, hey, guys, what are you doing in space? Is it the real market? The answer is yes. You can join TSAT, become our supplier, uh, come together uh, to, the, to this new, new age and new area for optical, optical laser communication or optical communication in space. So for us, it's, it's that um, we have a long tra tradition at TSAT. So we started, you know, at AIG, Telefunken, uh, in, in, in Germany with optics, with terrestrial optics. And uh, today we are transferring what we see, what is available from the telecom market uh, in space. That is, that is uh, our, our mission. Um, so where can we find uh, technology partners uh, who are um, uh, very successful on Earth? Yeah? And, uh, and uh, together with our parts agency and our triple E center, we can do radiation tests. We can we can perform uh, breadboarding and and put that in, in our test bed and to see how far we can go to the next level. So all uh, um, wavelengths existing 1064, 1550. Uh, we are using different modulation schemes, on-off keying, BPSK, QPSK for higher data rates, uh, and uh, and the. The PPM now for for deep space, the high photon efficiency uh, standard could could come with PPM. So the next slide um, gives you an overview and pictures um, what we are doing here. So <clears throat> starting from the from the left side, uh, we are using 1064 nanometer for the longer range uh, and higher data rate. Um, and 1550 for the shorter ranges. In the middle, you see the CON LCT, the Constellation Terminal. Uh, currently, uh, here SDA standard is going for for 1550 on-off keying uh, with lower data rates. Um, unfortunately, we could do, we could do more, but uh, but customer may may do not need uh, so high data rates at the moment. This will this will grow, of course. Um, and um, the, the thing is that we, of course, need uh, in our chain optical power amplifiers. Yeah, you can do it with, with wider aperture or with optical power amplification. And uh, if you say or ask me what is needed, uh, I say, OK, um, we cannot, we cannot uh, have enough uh, power, optical power. Uh, in a sufficient way. So uh, um, where are the, the, the optical power amplifiers which uh, grows uh, up to 20 watts, 25 watts, 30 watt uh, in space? That, that would be a, a, a big step uh, uh, what, what we need uh, to, to overcome and to close and to work with smaller apertures. So next, next slide. Next page. Uh, summary: What is in orbit? Yeah, so um, all, all trust in this technology. It's it's a proven technology, optical inter-satellite links, uh, and I think that TSAT did a good job in in uh, um, yeah uh, breaking the wall of the technology. Now others can follow and say, uh, look, TSAT did it. Why not? Why not? Uh, others can do it. Therefore, we we are seeing. Um, a lot of uh, yeah, activities in, in, in on the global field for optical intersatellite links. I think also it comes with with announcement of uh, of investors of big investors like like SpaceX uh, or Telesat uh, who are starting that uh, also on a commercial way, and this is really um, uh, increasing and inspiring us. Um, that we are going in all directions. So for for uh, bigger bigger and larger um, uh, distances for data relay with our LCT-135 for EDRS and expand this one. Uh, on the other side, uh, um, also very, very small, the cube lasers, which uh, are very small terminals. Yeah, So between that, we have a lot of, of applications. Uh, and unfortunately, you, you need terminals, special terminals for special applications. You cannot do all with one. So the next one gives you gives you the roadmap uh, where we came from. So we started with these uh, 1997. We 
we were awarded by, by Teledesic, Motorola for 840 Constellation terminals. Um, this was a real ignition point uh, in, in the company. Uh, at this time, we were Bosch, Bosch Telecom. And uh, we had this, uh, the competence from optics uh, from, the, from the telecom world. And we brought that in space. Um, um, then we, we went, it was unfortunately that Motorola stopped that. Um, but uh, but we, we continued uh, and uh, concentrated then on data relay uh, with, with these two products, Leo Smart and Geo LCT. Uh, and now, meanwhile, uh, we see that, that the, the constellation, broadband constellation market, optical intersatellite links are really growing. And uh, what is needed, it's needed to, to get more, um, more modularity in that you have a reuse of building blocks. Uh, of course, the trend is for higher the higher data rate, but not not in all markets. May the military market is not looking for for uh, for 100 gigabit. That 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 have to go hand in hand with uh, with processors and with uh, with downlink capacity. Yeah, what to do with 100 gigabit coming from four from 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 four sides? So 400 gigabit in the middle. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's a thing. Of course, lower cost and volume production. Yeah, if uh, you are having contracts for 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 Telesat or SpaceX, and you have to go for for 100 terminals per month. Yeah, so that is what you need, and uh, and therefore we are here at TSAT. We are uh, able to handle high volume production, and uh, that is of course a key for all investors at the end. And the next slide is. Um, um, a, a slide which we where we are on the other side of the corner we can do it also very small yeah so it's a, a very affordable um, technology for for getting hands on uh, so the make it small what can we do for the market uh, we can we can offer uh, such small terminals where where people can make hands-on technology so the pixel so photo cross laser uh, program is in orbit. We did it together with DLR. So Benjamin uh, is, is with me here in this uh, webinar from DLR who can also answer more questions on the Cube L technology. Uh, it's an Osiris technology and uh, it's a very affordable, a very affordable terminal. And um, we need that now to go to the next slide. We need that now to, um, to let it fly and let the market grow. So what we are doing is we are offering these pixel mission uh, that others may can, can start their engineering work on optical ground stations. So we can make flight passes. Uh, you can call us and can say, hey, can you, can you light us uh, in, in, in some countries wherever you are and to, um, to validate your optical ground station? Because what we need, of course, for this market downlinks uh, that uh, that there is a, um, a capacity on Earth, so a global optical ground station network where all all partners are working together, that we can overcome the the hurdles of atmospherical blocking. So therefore, we are inspiring people to to join us, also to uh, to collaborate on this optical ground station. We are not a supplier of of equipment for optical ground stations, but we need that that we can also build up uh, in space the network, which is then uh, a, a perfect start for quantum key distribution, because here you need downlinks. So thank you. This brings me to the end of this presentation. Thank you very much, Matthias. It means the world to us that TESAT is in the room supporting this. And you know, one thing, one of the secrets of success is redundancy in space, but also in Epic. You saw how we solved the, the, the problem with no problem about it. Let's go to some questions for you. The first one is coming from Manfred from Minaric. Manfred, what's on your mind? Yeah, um, I would be interested to, to see a bit on the innovation fields of TSAT on, on, on the lower levels, not, not on the system level, but on the sub-assembly component level. What, what are you investing? Um, which areas are on your interest to save money and go to serial production? This would be really interesting. That is, of course, something which I will not share in this video. Uh, YouTube call, though, because that's a core competence of TSAT, uh, which core competences you have, uh, we, we have. So 
Um, we are investing in, uh, in, in, in terminals, which are uh, meeting the price point of the customer yeah, to win the contracts and to have the high performance in short time. Yeah? So whatever is needed to do that uh, is, is, is done by us to be successful. And this is what we are doing since, since 30 years now. So what is your, your specific question? What are you looking for? Yeah, I, I was thinking whether you're you're open to share some of your yeah uh, work fields on new materials, what what you intend to develop for the future to save mass, size, uh, cost. Uh, where do you see some potential for cost savings? That, that's, I mean, without disclosing too much details, uh, I understand. <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 a laser comp terminal is not so not so complex. Yeah, you have optical heads and you have electronic units, and inside the, the electronic units, you are, you are using um, uh, special detectors, yeah, which uh, have to come uh, from uh, and and now given by by the customer's wavelength choice, uh, which could come from the telecom world. So we are investing in radiation uh, measures, yeah, with in qualification of uh, of uh, promising technology. So we buy that technologies, we make our uh, our radiation test, give it to the triple E center and look uh, how far we can come. But the commercial of the shelf is not, not every time um, an, uh, an answer to everything, uh, facing the problems of, uh, of, uh, of constant uh, quality flow from, from the commercial of the shelf com coming from the automotive part. So, our volumes are still too low yeah, to, to go to, uh, um, to, to grab what is existing and let it fly yeah, because you cannot be sure that, that uh, in, in, uh, in a half of the year you can get the same quality. So that is a real, uh, that's a hurdle between. Therefore, sometimes, okay, we have to, do, to start and to invest in our own technologies and uh, with, with, uh, with the skills we have. Um, yeah. That But yes, let's combine the Q&As now between the two presentations, yeah. as I promised, uh, because there's a couple of people I want the two of you to meet. And the first one is coming from DTU Space. Fatime, yes, and thank you so much for being with us. Tell us, what's on your mind for Matias and Dan? Um, actually, I wrote there about the, the pointing because that's the pointing accuracy was the was the quite important for laser communication when they were wanted to provide as a satellite provider for the laser comms. I just wanted to know pointing accuracy uh, that they can provide. That for Dan, what is the best pointing accuracy that you provide? Well, we have. Um... We're in the arc second domain. If we have, uh, if we use um, our what we call our precise uh, ADCS system, uh, which includes uh, star trackers and so on, so we can get really down to very, very, uh, very, very high pointing accuracy. I, I don't know the, precisely the exact uh, the exact number, but it's 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 quite uh, it's it's quite good. All right. Uh, yeah, quite good is good enough for this. I, I think you should have a, a private meeting because I want yeah, yeah. Dan and Matthias yeah, to, to meet I, I would two like other key figures. Yeah, the, the, yes. oh, sorry, I can jump in though. But, but uh, when the question is what, what is needed to, to fly an optical terminal, so, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the spacecraft, the spacecraft uh, pointing for such uh, a cube, for example, take that one, yeah, a cube. Uh, sat, uh, have not have no course pointer. That means the satellite have to point us in the right direction, which have a accuracy of plus minus one degree. That is needed from the spacecraft, and the rest is done uh, by by the by a beacon from the ground to uh, to uh, makes a link to the to a cube in the Leo. Um, that is that is plus minus one uh, pointing uh, accuracy. What is needed. Um, most of our terminals are, have a, a very autonomous, a very autark system uh, in terms of, uh, of spiral scanning. Yeah, we are using that and we are compensating um, um, the, uh, the uncertainty codes of the spacecrafts. Yeah, if we know before what the, the satellite is doing and we know the uncertainty, uh, then we can calculate uh, it with our algorithms. 
Now, Dan and Matias, I want you to meet two of what I believe are going to be two of your suppliers. Let's meet future Tesla supplier PLX. Uh, Matias, stay with me for a minute because you're going to like what they're going to hear. Uh, PLX mm -hmm. is developing with Epic many, many, many retro reflectors. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Peter Hart. Uh, I think you have one short slide to share, and I really think this is the best possible time in the history of PLX to show the slide. I'm just joking. Please tell us, the floor is yours. Peter? Connectivity is always an issue when it comes to satellite communication. Never is. It never is. Connectivity is not the issue. I think we lost Peter for another reason. Peter Hart, yes. Can we hear you? Can you hear me now? Loud and clear, yes. Can you see the... Uh... Crystal clear. Can, can you see this, the uh, slide? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Well, I've got 60 seconds to do a quick uh, introduction to PLX. Thanks again, Jose, and thanks for an excellent meeting. Um, PLX, for those who don't know, is based in New York. I've been uh, in space optics for over 50 years, going back to uh, Soyuz uh, supply. So we make um, lenses, optical assemblies, retro reflectors, and so on. Um, what's new is um, we've moved into active optics division based mostly on MEMS technology, um, which is fairly novel. That combined with our monolithic optical structures, um, we can make low cost, high precision, high speed, multiple target tracking um, devices with sub arc second precision. Um, so we see a number of applications for this technology in space, free space optics, um, tracking laser rangefinders, space docking, debris tracking, and what we're, I'm, I'm mostly here to listen and learn what exists in this field. And we're very interested in any people who are interested in that kind of technology uh, for tracking objects um, and integrating our stuff. Into Thank you it. so much, Peter. And this will actually be an introduction because I also want uh, Matthias and Dan to hear about the beam shaping solutions of Kylabs, an award-winning company. David, thank you so much for being with us today. An award-winning company in ESA projects. David, tell us about how beam shaping revolutionizes satellite communication and tell us mostly what you can do for Matthias from TESAT. The floor is yours. <laughs> cool. Do you hear me? Cloud and clear. Great. Uh, and you should see my screen. I should, but I don't. Let's see. All the way from Brittany. I can't wait to start traveling again. Seriously, can't. Let's go slide shade mode. The floor is yours. We can't hear David. We can't hear you. Bottom left corner, there is different options for the microphone. Uh, select the banks, the best one that fits Skylab's solutions. Yes. It's better. Better. Yes. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so, thank you very much. First, it's always a pleasure to be. Uh, at an epic meeting. Um, I am uh, David Aldu, I'm product manager at Kylabs, and I will present what we can do for space communication. And in particular, how we can improve laser communication through the atmosphere. So first, what do we do at Kylabs? I'll try to, wish to be uh, relatively quick because uh, I know uh, a lot of you have questions, I'm sure. Um, at Kylabs, we are still a relatively young company. Uh, and uh, we developed, uh, the, that was developed around a core technology that is called multiplane light conversion. So, and with this technology, with this unique technology, we are able to do optical beam shaping. Thanks to this, uh, we can manipulate very precisely the shape of the light and it gives us access to a very wide branch of application. For example, uh, in laser processing, that is very different from space, uh, anywhere you have a factory, we can modify the shape of the light to improve the efficiency or speed of the factory. Uh, in fiber communication, that is also very different. We can increase the throughput of local area network by getting rid of modal dispersion, for example. And uh, anywhere in general where you can modify the shape of the light uh, to, for a new application, we can do this. So for example, in active imaging, the square flat top that you see 
on the image here is uh, dedicated to active imaging. The Hermit Gaussian mode on the bottom is for uh, communication inside optical fiber network. And overall, we can do any custom application anywhere you need to modify the shape of that. And thanks to this technology, we developed a product line specifically dedicated to laser communication. So if you look at the right image, you know this kind of image, many people show that, but uh, you typically have a representation of what the future of free space networks might look like with hybrid radio frequency and optical communication. I do not go to the advantage of each of the technology, but uh, overall at Skylabs, our target is really to help deploying laser communication everywhere it is needed. And in particular, everywhere turbulence impacts or degrade the optical links. So let's say we stay beyond the uh, stratosphere, but we try to look at uh, the satellite uh, and the laser communication with satellite. So what can we provide to the community? Here I present the two main product lines that we have, uh, one for the emission and one for the reception. Feedback more on the left is a plug and play turbulence mitigating comp component. The application is relatively similar to adaptive optics. Also, the concept is very different. It relies on the decomposition of light on modes or shapes, because as I mentioned, uh, modifying the shape of the light is really what we do very well. So we manipulate the shape of the light and we demultiplex the modes uh, uh, that we collect and recombine them with a new module that we developed recently. <coughs> and in the end, what we want to provide is really a black box that collects a pair tube beam that was pair tuned by the turbulence, by the atmospheric turbulence. So you have beam wandering, beam defocusing, scintillation, all this kind of thing. It comes to our black box. We collect the beam, we demultiplex and do uh, everything inside the box. And in the end, you recouple the light into a unique standard single mode fiber that is compatible with standard telecom infrastructure. And our aim with this component is to be able to support optical link project at different integration stage and uh, typically from the component to the optical ground station. Um, also, if you wish to know more about that, we have a talk on Friday morning on the ongoing XO conference. Uh, and that's basically the idea. Uh, the second product line that we have and that is much more simple in terms of understanding, at least, even though it's relatively complex to implement. Um, uh, so the second product is Tilda Emit, and the idea is to combine several laser sources to be able to have a very high power uh, laser source for feeder links, for example. Uh, also, this application is very similar to uh, what we can do, I don't know, for, um, for LIDAR, uh, for counter measurement. It is also very similar to what we could do for um, pre-compensation for feeder links. So basically, there are also a lot of applications from this type of product, because when you manipulate the shape of the light, you can do a lot of things. One last thing that I that is not a real product yet, uh, but that uh, we are investigating, and I want to mention because Minerik talked about it, is uh, to be able to do some beam steering or collecting pointing errors uh, with a passive component because with the same component that we use for turbulence mitigation, we are also capable of collecting or emitting light with a certain tilt or tip of tilt. And so we are also uh, capable of doing that. And the last slide is, uh, what do we need? Uh, first, we need new challenges. Uh, what we want, the people we want to work uh, with are communication companies who want to deploy laser communication network. Um, I speak, of course, of uh, end users in the space sectors, like uh, typically uh, satellite to ground links. But also, uh, if you want to, like as Minarik mentioned, if you want to deploy networks with uh, balloons or I don't know drones or uh, even uh, um, a car or any vehicle. Uh, we want to be part of this optical network. Uh, of course, ground station uh, integrators is a big uh, part of this, and uh, we are we really want to be able to understand uh, what are the problems, uh, what are the challenges, what are the roadmaps 
uh, to be able to uh, to map our future development on this roadmap on this roadmap something very interesting for us also is to be able to find new partners so i know there are a lot of research labs uh, in the in this epic meeting uh, we are for example interesting in uh, pre-compensation technique in uh, uh, of course, adaptive optic free turbulence mitigation, but also in orbital angular momentum for QK, if you're QKD. Uh, overall, anywhere you have a beam shaping problem, we want to be uh, a partner of you. And in the end, there are at least two things that we need at the moment. One that is very important for us is a photonic supplier with fast processes cycles and four or five dBs of insertion losses. Uh, we are already discussing with uh, most of the photonic foundries that are in the room, but overall we want to, to send the message that uh, for us insertion losses are very important and we don't want to be in a research and development process, we want to be in an industrial process where we order a product and not a research and development uh, um, project. Thank you very much, David, for this. There is many people that want to help you. That's, that's great fun. because that's what's epic. Uh, for example, Miguel yeah. Melo from Portugal, NW Technologies. Can you help with the EDFA? They are looking for a low noise EDFA, Miguel. Hello, Jose. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, in principle, yes. So we need to look into detail to the requirements, but in principle, yes. Miguel, you are in a space meeting. You provide laser technologies, also uh, also the electronics behind it. What is the, the application that you see for a space, for the, for example, the nanosecond, la po uh, nanosecond pulse laser line that you provide? Yes, on the space we have for, for communications mainly. That, that's the main, uh, main application for our lasers, yes. Another company, Miguel, David, that wants to help you all the way from Germany, Fraunhofer IOSB. Simon, mm -hmm. what's on your mind? I have you muted, Simon. Hello. Yes. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a question. Um, the way I understand this uh, turbulence mitigation um, of TILBA is that um, turbulence mitigation is moved from the optical mechanical domain, uh, so away from sensor and the DM, the follow mirror to the digital domain, where for DSP, somehow in a black box, the turbulence is mitigated. Um, is there a penalty on the data rate that this DSP imposes? Uh, no, to date, uh, I don't know if you hear me well. Please stay clear. Yeah, it's great. Uh, <laughs> so uh, on the, there is to date no limitation that we foresee because the limitations are mainly due, for example, we, we can identify them, it's are mainly due typically to the length of the different fibers. To date, we have already tested and delivered the first component that works at uh, one gigabyte. And of course, uh, it's not a firm limitation. It's what we had uh, in our lab. Uh, the next steps will be to be able to test it at uh, 10 gigabyte and beyond that. Um, but overall, we don't see uh, any limitation. Uh, when I say any limitation, of course, uh, it's on a reasonable uh, scale, typically 10 uh, to 40 gigabyte. Thank you so much, David, and congratulations. Congratulations yes, on what you are achieving, both in the laser manufacturing as well as in the telecom. And I know that ESA is very, very happy with the, your space project. Really, really great job. I want to go now to the final part of this presentation. It's really, truly great meeting. I see that we're going to be a, a bit out of time, but this is really going to worth, be worth your while. Thierry, all the way from CES Techcom, we all want to hear about QKD in space. You are today the holder of the flag of quantum technologies on this fantastic meeting, the floor and the attention of everyone goes to CES. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I'm very um, uh, happy to participate to this uh, very interesting session. So um, from, from the SES point of view, I don't know if you can see my screen now. Not yet. We will okay. see your beautiful background. We're looking for satellites behind you. Let's see. Just tell me when you see it. It is coming. Wonderful. All the way from the stratosphere. Hmm. Still not here yet. I think, can you double click on your screen? Yep. Aye, aye, aye. 
like you said, uh, life is always... Uh, yeah, challenge. I told you. It, it works very well in practice. That, that means nothing. But you are in space, so you know very well what this means. Uh, let's stop sharing the screen. Stop Somebody sharing. just texted me the word ExoMars to me. I don't know why they meant. Can you stop sharing the screen and then start sharing the screen again? Okay. Try again. That's the Microsoft Windows way of solving problems. Let's see. Share. Okay. Yes, I knew it. Uh, let's go to, I think you have a little window. Yes, the floor is yours. Okay, super. Thank you very much. So very quickly, an uh, introduction of, uh, of myself. So Thierry, Thierry Drauss, uh, working uh, at SES uh, Satellite. So we are um, one of the largest satellite operator, operating fleet of um, MEO and uh, GEO satellites and covering a huge amount of um, um, uh, world population for video transmission and, uh, and network type of communication. Um, we have in our DNA what we call, uh, you know, like a space innovation. Um, we, from, from the history of SES, we, we were one of the first uh, operators to use a proper, um, electrical propulsion for uh, our satellites. We were the first one riding a SpaceX a reusable rocket uh, to, to bring uh, one of our birds in the sky. And from now, most of our satellites are fully digital. And uh, the next challenge we are um, uh, riding now is the quantum key distribution. So um, I guess you are all aware of the, uh, this quantum key distribution and quantum communication infrastructure. I will not go into the details uh, because I would need an hour. However, uh, why um, quantum key distribution needs satellites? Obviously, from the um, uh, from the concept point of view, um, ensuring uh, security uh, of the keys of the symmetric keys using quantum technologies are um, uh, obviously from a terrestrial point of view uh, limited by the distance uh, and the attenuation on, on fiber optics uh, that um, the link is introducing. So one option is really to bring a lot of uh, secured and trusted nodes on the ground to be able to make a long distance communication. Or the other, the, the other principle is basically using a satellite for, for this. And this is exactly what uh, we are currently um, uh, working at. So having um, a, a space system providing quantum keys to users as an end-to-end -end service, this is really the project we are currently working on. Um, in a nutshell for the program. So this program was initiated in 2017 uh, within an ESA framework, a Skylight program, together with a, a European consortium. And the goal here is really to design and implement from an end-to-end -end service point of view, uh, a Leo system that will uh, distribute quantum keys. Um, the technology we are using um, is uh, relying on the BB84 uh, protocol, so prepare and measure, where the satellite is considered as a trusted node. And the satellite distributes basically uh, the pair of keys in two different locations. Um, this is a really end-to-end -end, uh, optical and uh, quantum technology. Uh, for instance, the uh, random number, number generator in, is also based on quantum technologies for, for the system. And uh, also to be clear, this satellite system, this end-to-end -end system distributes keys. It does not bring the telecommunication aspect. So it's a really a layer on top of the satellite communication or terrestrial communication, bringing cybersecurity uh, on top. Um, the... Um, as I explained, um, this is not the, 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 the program we are currently following is not a purely technical demonstration of technology. It's really bringing all the pieces into an end-to-end -end solution. So being from the spacecraft, being from the uh, optical terminal on board of the spacecraft, the ground station, um, and also the KMS, so the key management system, how you integrate basically the keys into the existing networks. That's really the, the goal of the uh, the project we are currently developing. Um, moving to uh, the capabilities. So uh, here from a CS point of view, uh, we have uh, acquired experience in the field of quantum communication through this ESA project. We are also involved largely in the uh, Euro QCI, so the European Quantum Communication Infrastructure together with our partners. Uh, to really bring uh, into the into Europe a, um, a, a fully 
tested end-to-end -end solution. Uh, we have, as a satellite operator, strong capabilities in, in the operational domain uh, for the uh, providing the really operation of the end-to-end the, the -end system. What are we looking for from our partners? It's really a new, new space type of approach, really, to overcome the lengthy process of satellite procurement and, and program. We want to be really fast here. Uh, market is moving. Europe is quite um, uh, not that advanced, advanced compared to uh, China, for instance, or US. And we, we believe there is a, an opportunity for Europe to, to bridge that gap now. We want also our partners to be product oriented from design. When uh, a component is designed, when it, it's developed, uh, we need to have partners that have this scale up approach and being able to make production um, of, of the technology. Obviously, for um, um, the uh, implementation schedule, but also from a cost efficiency point of view. Last but not least, if we are speaking about EuroQCI, we want to also bring uh, European partners into the game and really leverage uh, this ecosystem and, and, and bring really everybody into the play and, and, have, um, and to really enable the um, um, European partners to, to support us in, in, in that uh, venture. That, that's it for, for this. It's a very, very, very quick one, but uh, I, I hope you capture a bit the, uh, wh where we want to go there. I, I like that you were quick, but what I really liked is that you talk about quantum technologies and you position yourself, you position CES satellites as an entry point for the companies making photonics for space to also enter, to also enter the quantum world. And as uh, I love quantum technologies as much as you can imagine, uh, I would like to ask you one clear thing. There are test beds, there are test beds. I think there is one in Poland uh, that is uh, looking for the satellite communication. There is one in Padua. Uh, is there any test bed in which the companies that I have here with me can test the technologies for, for the quantum projects mm -hmm. in, in so, space? Uh, there, yeah, so there, there is, uh, the, 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 our, our ambition is to have a flight mission for by 2024. Yes. And, and this, is, this is exactly what we are aiming at. Uh, obviously, for th there will be a, 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 an in-orbit demonstration. The goal is not to only have one satellite, obviously, for testing the technology. We want to deploy a service. So, um, and the service cannot be done with a, with a single satellite. So here we are speaking about uh, a constellation. And this is also what the current European Commission has in mind also to have a, a, a constellation that overlays the communication system and bring the, the quantum keys. Uh, for security purposes. I would like to remind everyone that on April 9th, we have a whole event on QKD, and we're going to talk a lot about the open QKD test beds funded by the European Commission, because we believe, we do believe the success story like CES satellites can be seriously benefited by testing our technologies for the quantum industry. We saved the best for the last. We go to Kasia from Airbus. We started with Isa talking about the Skylet. We finished with Airbus. And I know Kasia is a big fan of Epic and also a big fan of integrated photonics. Kasia, thank you very much for being with us. Send us off, for, at least for me, for Easter holidays, the way that we deserve after this hard work of the last two hours. The floor goes to Airbus. I love saying that. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. Thank you for a kind introduction uh, and, and the invitation to that meeting. So I start quickly with my slides. I know we are uh, a little bit over time, so um, I go very fast through some of them, also because we, we've discussed many of it uh, today already. Uh, but I will be speaking about something slightly different, and uh, that is microwave photonics. Um, right. So... I go quickly to, well, a first slide about Airbus. Uh, it's the it's largest aeronautic and space company in Europe. And we are uh, leading the way at, across three business areas. So commercial air aircraft, um, um, helicopters, and, uh, and of course, space and defense where I'm based. Uh, and this slide represents uh, really what we do in uh, the context of uh, space. And I will be focusing uh, for in this talk primarily on the uh, telecommunication satellites and, and the space equipment that uh, we are building, developing and using uh, for, for our telecom uh, missions. Um, 
So this we've seen today many times, and, uh, and it's all about links, connectivity between satellites, connectivity between users. Uh, but I think what I wanted to say is that uh, those links are not always optical, and we still use this connectivity in RF domain. Uh, and that's very um, related to what, what I do is to use photonics on board of the satellite uh, to, to help that uh, increase the, the uh, connectivity in, in RF domain as well. Um, so there are types of various types of links uh, and they can um, be in RF uh, frequencies from well C band to KA, KU band and going higher in uh, RF frequencies. Um, depending on the links, there will be uh, various parameters that would describe these links and they are very mission dependent, orbit dependent, etc. Uh, but where I'm going are our challenges. And we've heard that as well, the size, weight, and power. And from photonics perspective for those applications, we usually don't have that much issue with the size and weight. We actually can reduce the weight by using photonics, which is great for satellite applications. So we are speaking about peaks, we are speaking about fibers, uh, that, that's what we need. Uh, however, the power, that is something that we, we really need to improve to, um, to have more photonics or, on board of, of satellites. And another one is cost. Uh, right, so those are the challenges we are trying to tackle. And my next slide is, um, again, well, microwave photonics. So, uh, well, that is our product. This is what, what we developed, uh, a satellite integrator. Uh, you can see there is no optical terminal on, on that satellite, but uh, so we still use RF uh, and we include optics inside. So optics is now the enabling technology uh, for very high throughput um, satellites. So what we can offer, uh, that, that's the first question, uh, is uh, the collaboration and business opportunities for um, photonics companies. And those business opportunities come from the fact that there is a demand for very high throughput satellites. And uh, for, from photonics perspective or photonics supplier, uh, component supplier perspective, when there is a high throughput satellite or very high throughput satellite, that means volume. We need more than one laser. We need tens of lasers or even a hundred of lasers per payload. So we increase the volume. Uh, the next is that the, the payloads are more complex. So there, there are processors on board, there can be active antenna arrays, and that again means volume. And that also means we need integration. Uh, we need the, these uh, transmitters and receivers being integrated, being co-packaged with electronics. So that's, um, th th that's what, uh, what, what, what is needed. And then increasing the bandwidth and, and capacity. So, so yes, the uh, VHDS that, uh, that, that is required. And my last bullet point is, um, is, is again has to do a little bit with why we are developing also the optical links. Uh, because of the bandwidth limitation in the RF spectrum, uh, we go towards the higher frequencies uh, for, for that increase in capacity. And here for the onboard photonics, the higher the frequency we look at, so the QVW bands uh, in our domain, the better photonics actually performs, the, the biggest advantage for photonics. So what we are looking for, uh, my number one is the uh, more efficient laser sources uh, and amplifiers. So because optics in our case is confined to the payloads, we, we can use any wavelength we, we want. It's on board, right? Uh, but the efficiency is defined. It's a world plug efficiency, we, we can say. Uh, so many wavelengths can be considered, but they need to be, they need to consume a very little power for the optical output that they are giving. Uh, we are very much looking into integrated photonics and electronics together. We are looking for novel packages. So kind of drifting away from the um, uh, gold box. Uh, we want a higher volume. We want smarter packaging. Uh, we, we would like to hear from the community what are the novel aspects of photonics packaging. 
um, the tunable sources and the applications for the beam steering, beam forming, the fast optical switching. So that's probably as well very uh, related to PICS and um, the, the fiber links for both analog and digital signal connectivity. Uh, so that is very quickly what we can offer and what, uh, what we are looking for. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kasia, for this. I really love what you're doing with our members, connecting them and giving them potential opportunities for cooperation. We have questions for you. And the first one is coming from one of our key companies in the space sector. We go to DTU Space. Fateme, you, not one, you have two questions. You have two questions for Kasia. What's on your mind? Uh, hi, hi, Kasia. Um, so I was just more, I was concerning about the, the beam steering, for example, you mentioned, uh, how, but you're, you're, are you doing much development yourself on it or is it you're asking for providers or? Uh, well, we, we've, we think for the beam steering, we are looking for collaboration. Okay. And. Uh, and one another thing, what is it that are you concerned their frequency? Is it only you're uh, looking at the infrared or are you looking at the... We are looking at the ref. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, but <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> that was not for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think uh, my rest of question will not be concerning you, sorry. Okay. All right, so Kasia, I have uh, one more thing to ask you. I, I love this slide that you showed to us about uh, microwave photonics. And when we talk about microwave photonics here, you actually did mention about uh, novel packaging. And of course, we, lo we love that. You know how much I love when people talk about novel packaging. Could you, could you share with us a couple of ideas that I could work with when I introduce you to all the different companies who are going to be loving talking to you about novel packaging solutions. Uh, right. So I think rather than really introducing what we may think we want, we, we would like to hear what is possible in order to have, well, RF interface and our multiple RF interfaces. So looking at the arrays of devices, uh, so an interface going up to 32 gigahertz, let's say, and as well um, uh, fiber arrays. So how can we have a multiple fibers going into one package? After the previous meeting, the last time you spoke, already a while ago, I made a lot of introductions be prepared this time because the challenge that you just <laughs> mentioned is one that we really, really love at Epic. You know, normally I finish these meetings with a summary slide, but today European Space Agency did the job for me. So thank you very much, Isa, for being fantastic. The, the, if I had to summarize this meeting is there is a lot of opportunities for photonic components or photonic transceivers using the telecom wavelength 15, 15 nanometers, DWDM solutions, lasers, EDFAs. There is a lot of opportunities. I would like to say that for those who have to leave, you can leave. For those who can stay, now is when we do the business. That was where the business starts. We are going to go now on the wonder.me chat. You're going to get in the chat a link. You're going to get a link there. Click on the link and close Zoom. We all move to a different interface that is suitable for us to now get to know each other and do business because I love doing business. Today was the last, the last meeting of the season three of the online technology meetings and what a great season it has been. We wanted to finish high, higher, higher, we want to finish in the stars and we did. Thank you, Sana Pika, for the amazing job you have done collecting all these companies looking for challenges that our members can solve. And also thank you, Access Space, for not only for bringing me Minaric, but also coming yourself with all the new ideas. We're going to be contacting you constantly. I'm talking on behalf of a fantastic team of experts who we dedicate all our life when we are awake and we, we are dreaming, dedicate all our life to photonics. If you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, drop me an email, jose.pozo and epic and I will answer it after my holidays, which start, which start 18 minutes ago. See you on Tuesday. Until the very next time, wash your hands, wear a mask, because very soon we are going to be traveling again. I can't wait. See you soon. Bye bye.